Hello. Oh my God. Hello. Hello. I'm not even going to. Okay. Wow. And I was in another Zoom meeting, so I didn't even have the waiting room open. So I don't even know who I'm not even say who's. Wow. It's great to see you guys. I'm going to stay. Wow. Tons of people coming. Okay. And we're just going to get rolling because we're, we're almost at the and so I'm not even going to weigh in on this fierce competition. Okay. Um, but hello, Jaisha and Mon. Hello, Mon and Jaisha. Hello, John. Hello, just kidding. Um, hello, Elona. Hello, Ray. Oh, more people. Uh, wow. Okay, Nick is good. Okay, sorry. People more coming in. Sorry, sorry. Okay. Sorry, sorry. Okay. Hello, Elona. Hello, Rachel. Thank you for the message about Nick. Hello. Good afternoon, Jay Lynn. Hi, Michaela. No. <laughs> Hello, Zimin. Good afternoon, Andrew. Good afternoon, We She. Oh, sorry, preachers. That's cool. Okay. 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 <laughs> All right. I'm going to, I'm going to try to ignore jokes just because we have blah, blah, blah. Um, hello, Lizzie. Oh, sorry. Wait, I think more people. Sorry, sorry. Okay. Um, hell, good afternoon, Manoj. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I, right, I'm just kidding. Um, yes, and good point, Starni. I mean, hello, Starnisha, and excellent point that it's the second to last class, right? So, and strangely, we're on track. We should be fine. Um, and um, I'm glad I'm seeing you guys today, uh, but I do want to make the most of the time so that we have time for jokes in the very last class. Hey, Alyssa, oh, sorry, hi, Leslie. So yeah, but good good point, Starnisha, definitely. Hi, Leslie, hey, Alyssa. Um, hello, Ruby. Oh, and we have Maya coming. Um, um, Again, I, you know how much I enjoy this class, but I'm, yes, I'm going to try to not enjoy it today. I'm going to try to um, make the same progress today that I did make in the morning. Again, if there's, you know, whatever we do have class on Wednesday, it means that you pretty much did the same thing that we did in the morning, which means, you know, there's no reason that you have to watch the video or anything. But just so you know, when we're done with this today, there are sort of be two videos on this and two videos on Monday. Do you, because again, what I'm trying to do is be get explicitly as close to the final exam as I can with you guys. Um, um, so if I guess what I'm just trying to say, we're going to get rolling again. What I'm trying to say though is, if if we get to a detail, or certainly ask, stop me and ask me questions. But if we get to some detail and I do it today, and you can see how it's relevant to your final exam, or you can see how it's important, but somehow it's still confusing you, or and then you go home and think about it. It's so confusing. You might just also want to check out the other video just because I might have just said it in a slightly different way that might by accident make all the difference. Just like that, just in case you forgot. I mean, so in other words, there's twice as much video material available just in case on any of this stuff. But okay, okay. What what I'm trying to do today um, is... is oh, Okay. Got it. Thank you very much. Got, got it. Okay. Um, so yeah, I, well, I'm going to continue exactly with the problem that we were doing Monday. And again, as a reminder, that's like a problem that I feel like if you can really understand all the nuances of that problem, then you're a quarter step away from really understanding all the nuances of the inclined plane, which is the final exam, which is, you know, the practice document that's in your um, classroom. Again, I will put I'll be clearer in Google Classroom when I get a moment, but just to say again, I believe your final exam, your actual final exam document will be posted approximately 8 p.m. Tuesday, December, um, wait, wait, December, uh, a week from yesterday, December 14th, and will be due back by midnight of Sunday, of December 19th. I will say that explicitly in Google Classroom. Maybe I already did, but I'm just trying to be, again, as clear as I can. Yours will be posted no later than 8 p.m. Tuesday, the 14th, and will be due back by midnight, Sunday, the 19th. Again, you can work together, blah, 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 just like last time. And again, it will look very, very much like the thing that's 
in Google Classroom now. And again, by the time we get to the end of this class and our very last class on Monday, hopefully you'll really see how to do that final. In fact, there are even solutions in it. I almost keep forgetting. Um, but just one last thing again, the bulk of the final, the bulk of the final is that you're really examining a rough incline plane two different ways. It might, I don't know if that's confusing or not at first when you look at it, but the bulk of the final asks you to solve uh, the incline plane with in one coordinate system, one reference frame. Then it asks you to choose a different reference frame and solve the same problem again. The idea is that you will get the same correct answer at the end of the day in both the different coordinate system choices you make. It's just that you'll see that one seems less natural to choose, yet ends up being much more convenient and fast to choose. So that's what we're sort of trying to show you. And this all goes back to Galileo in the end, that it's all about making conscious choices of what perspective we choose to view the universe or to view, to measure motion through. Okay, so, and that's what I'm gonna get at today. So today I'm, I, I'm going to finish the actual problem that we were doing Monday and then show you how the choice of coordinate system whoop, and the resolving of vector components and all that like, like applies to your last inclined plane on the final. Okay, so just that's again for context. So, so yesterday, so I'm using the actual same PDF of notes. Um, yeah, you'll recall, hopefully. And so again, obviously, stop me at any moment with any questions or anything today. And again, we'll still have one more day Monday to put this all together to answer any questions, hopefully that you bring with you from the practice document. Um, but what am I trying to say? But I will say again today, I will tell you today exactly at what moment we shift our concern more explicitly to the inclined plane. Just please bear in mind that everything we do right now might not look like it's totally applicable, but you'll see how it is. Um, so. So the problem that we were doing was this block on a rough horizontal surface. The block had both types of friction, static friction coefficient and a kinetic coefficient coefficient. Um, it's being pulled up and to the right with some string that is tensioned at a certain angle. And we were being asked to figure out, is this block accelerating at all? And if so, what is its acceleration? That's what we're trying to solve. And so we're gonna go back to that right now. One thing, I, I sort of changed my mind twice and I'm changing my mind a third time. Before we go any further, you, you, I, you notice I wrote the values, the numerical values off to the left for this problem. And I, I've corrected one thing. It, at one point in your notes on Monday, I think I wrote that the tension equals 500 newtons. Like if you look at your notes, you might see that the tension says, oh, okay, okay, hold on. Uh, I'll, I'll look at the chat in one second, but it, um, I, you might've written five, I mean, I wrote, 500 newtons for the tension. Please correct that right now before we go any further. It, it won't change any of the physics that we've done so far, but it will change some things when we finally plug in numbers at the end. So change the tension, please, from 500 newtons to 50 newtons, which is what I should have written. Okay, so again, there's just a correction or an update to the numbers in this problem that we're analyzing. It should say 50 newtons, not 500. I'm going to just look in the chat. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, oh, okay, okay. No, great question in the direct chat. Didn't see this coming. Um, so it's in the direct chat. I'm going to read the question. I'm not going to read the name. I'm going to read the question. And then I'm going to tell you, that, believe me, I'm going to answer this. So, so the question in the direct chat is, uh, oh, I didn't? Okay. Wait, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, so do you see these numbers now? Can you see? I'm sorry. Uh, do you, and I know we haven't used it yet. We haven't. Let me, sorry. Let me be clear to everybody. We're trying to solve this physics problem. And we're trying to solve it with, the many sort of strategies and techniques that I would like you to have for the rest of your lives. And one of those strategies and techniques is I, when I solve physics problems, I keep it to the letters, the variables and the constants, as long as I possibly can. And at the very last moment, if there are numbers involved, I plug in the numbers and see what my numerical answer is. So, so it is absolutely true. I'm going out of order with the questions here for a second. Monday, I set up this problem for you. We started solving it. But it's true that we haven't used one number yet 
in our solution. We've been focusing on the diagrams and stuff like that. The numbers are going to come into play at the end. But I did mean, so I apologize if I didn't, I did intend to give you the numbers. That there are given numbers for this problem that will be necessary at the end. So I do want to make sure, or Starnisha or anybody else, can you read, can you see the numbers, the numerical values off to the left squeeze? Um, um, at the bottom left corner of this page, like capital T stands for tension. And so if I didn't give you these numbers before, please copy them now. Um, but if I did, please be aware that I, okay. Oh, okay, great, great, great. All right. Now, someone in the direct chat is asking, what's the difference between static and kinetic friction? That is a great question. I'm going to give a quick answer to it. And it is, it is in some of the lectures. I've given one of the lectures from last week, and it is in the videos. I'm not saying that scoldingly. I'm just saying, if you want to really like refresh this or really study this in time for the exam, like definitely go back and check out the videos. But I'm going to give you a short answer right now anyway. And you'll see for real as it plays out in this problem as we solve it together. But the basic difference is, as long as two rough surfaces are pressing against each other, they will exert friction against each other. However, at any given, excuse me, at any given moment, two rough surfaces will uh, exert one of two different possible types of friction. At any given moment, one type of friction is exerted. At first, when, when, when there are two objects together and you try to move one relative to the other, when you're trying to, or when some force is trying to slide one surface relative to the other or along the other, friction first attempts to prevent that. What the kind of friction that always kicks in first is called static friction. That's the kind of friction that attempts to hold one object in place relative to another. Static friction, and you'll see this, we're gonna analyze this, but static friction is variable. It will be nothing at all if it's not needed. If one object is just sitting on another and nothing else is going on, then there's no need for static friction. It's just sitting there. If you, if I start, if, if there's um, I can't, if, if if there's an op, if there's like a coke can on my desk and I start to push it with like one newton of force, the friction from the desk underneath the coke can will push back on the coke can with one newton of force and hold the coke can in place. Like like. Like that's why if you just blow on a coke can or something, that's a force that should accelerate the coke can. But if you just blow very lightly, you, you, even though F net equals MA, your F will not be enough to A the M because this force of static friction comes in and it doesn't be, oh, oh, cool, cool. Okay, good, good. All right, so I'll wrap this, I'm glad, cool. But I'll just, I'll finish this um, summary and then we'll see it in action here. Um, the static friction, varies, and I'm saying this to everybody now, so that you understand, static friction is a variable force. It will be exactly what it needs to be in order to keep something moving. If you push something with one Newton of force in order to get it going, static friction will push back with exactly one Newton of force, not more, because then the thing would like fly off in the other direction. So then if you start pushing harder with two Newtons of force, then static friction will push back with two Newtons of force. Static friction will do exactly uh, yeah. All right. So, and I'm going to get to all this, but so, so static friction acts to hold something in place. There's a maximum force of static friction past which static friction cannot succeed any longer. Once we exert a force that's greater than the maximum force of static friction, then the objects will move and then kinetic friction kicks into place. It's always one or the other, never both. And whether or not kinetic friction acts is determined by the maximum threshold of static friction. Now, we're going to see that in, now, can the friction force, quick summary here, or quick reminder, and then we're going to see this in action in the problem. But remember, the friction force of one object exerted on another always is um, uh, brought about by, is determined by, is, um, is um, it comes about as a result of two factors. The friction force F comes from two factors. One is roughness of material and the other is how hard material is squeezing against each other. One is the roughness of surfaces. The other is how hard the surfaces are pressing against each other. Those two numbers multiplied by each other 
multiplied together make the friction force. This is the normal force. When you multiply this amount by the coefficient of friction, the simple dimensionless fraction or decimal that represents how rough the surfaces are, when you multiply them together, you get one force called friction. Every material has two different coefficients, one for the static case and one for the kinetic case. The static coefficient is what you use to multiply to get static friction. We're going to do that in like two minutes. And the kinetic coefficient is what you do, is what you multiply by the normal force to get kinetic friction. Every surface has both those different coefficients, one for each possible case. The static coefficient is always greater than the kinetic coefficient because you have to overcome static in order to move at all. If the kinetic were greater ever than the static, then that means you that means you could overcome the static and thereby be moving, but then be slowed down so much by the kinetic friction that you don't move at all. It, it would just be a paradox. It wouldn't make any sense. So static, the coefficient of static roughness is, is always just a number between zero and one. And that number is always a little bit greater, always, than the roughness coefficient for, for motion, for kinetic. So you have to first, you have to get going and, th and then you're going. Um, but we're going to see this play out if, when I get back. To, but these are great questions. Um, yeah, one kind. So one coefficient is always greater than the other. The, the higher the coefficients are, the rougher the surfaces are. The, okay, great. Okay, cool. Um, okay, cool, cool. And totally points for closing a conversation. Okay, so, 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 so. All right, so this was the picture. This is what we're analyzing. And our goal, our ultimate goal for any Newton's law problem, no matter how complicated it looks, our goal is, whoops, sorry, is always, wow. Our goal is always to calculate acceleration. But in any problem involving friction, we have this like goal first to even find out whether there even is acceleration or not. So that was the question we were being asked uh, to answer here. Given the situation drawn on the previous page, we're asking, do are we pulling hard enough to move this thing at all? And then if so, like at what rate does it accelerate? Sorry, I just lost my oh here. Okay. Um, so that's what we were doing, right? And so we then are applying our procedure, our basic Newton Newtonian procedure for solving, which is the same procedure, no matter how complicated the problem is, whether it's for this problem or for the inclined plane in the lab, we apply our procedure, which is at first we do a system schema. We did that right yesterday, I believe. Then from the number of lines in the system schema, we create arrows in a pure free body diagram. This is pretty much where we left off, more almost where we left off uh, Monday. Notice again, I'm going to say that 50 million times, the number of arrows in the pure free body diagram necessarily equals the number of lines in the system schema. It really is sort of the purpose of why we drew the system schema, right? But then we looked at this thing and we said, okay, now, the purpose of all of this, the purpose of all of these diagrams and everything is to be able to set up Newton's second law and do the math. The purpose is to set up F net equals MA, sum of the Fs equals MA. But we have to recognize, the super important thing to recognize is that F net equals MA, sorry, we have to set it up and we have to solve for A. We have to, we have to plug in all these arrows into the left side of F net equals MA, plug in all the arrows, add them all up, taking into account minus signs, and get a total sum of all the forces. Divide by M and we'll have A. That's what we're trying to do. The thing we have to realize is F net equals MA is really a vector equation. What it really, really means is that F, the sum of all of the Fs along the X axis equals M times A along the X axis, while independently yet simultaneously, the sum of all the Fs along the y-axis equals the M times the acceleration along the y-axis. It's really, F net equals MA is really a set of simultaneous equations, like really. And what, when we do the math, we're really gonna do the math independently along each axis. That means we need to see a bunch of arrows along each axis. That's the purpose of all this. So we could, whatever arrows are going along one axis, we'll add them all up. And whatever arrows are going in the opposite direction in a given axis, we'll give those minus signs. So we need to see, what we need is a diagram where all of the arrows are along axes. And an arrow that is not on the X nor the Y axis does it no good. 
So we zoom. So we look at our pure free body diagram. This pre pure free body diagram, I'm telling you right now, when we will get to it eventually today and then Monday, but this pure, I mean, the pure free body diagram is this is is pure. It's the description of a situation, no matter what X or Y axis you choose. Like on your final exam, when it asks you to go through some stages about the inclined plane, even though it asks you to do it two different ways, the two different ways are the same to this point. They'll have the same system schema. They'll have the same free, pure free body diagram. But then you've got to make a choice. You've got to choose what is sorry, my x-axis and what is my y-axis. You're going to make that choice and any vector that is not lying along either axis, you're going to divide up into components. That's the choice that has to be conscious. That's kind of, and that's the Galileo moment and it's sort of the purpose of the final exam. Um, we're here to realize that any choice we make will work and will get the right answer, ultimately the same right answer. But some choices will be more convenient and require a lot less mathematical work than others. And the real issue of physics is making these choices. That's really what we're trying to learn here. It, it's clear to me that all of you can do the computations. That's actually not the hard part. Um, um, so we have to choose. You're gonna, and what do I mean by choose axes? I mean like one standard way to think about X and Y axis is that an X axis lies along the horizontal plane, like along the floor or the table in this problem. And the y-axis is perpendicular to that uh, and lies along the gravitational line. That's a standard set of axes. And axes are definitely always perpendicular to each other. But another thing you could do with the axes is you could tilt the axis. You could tilt them so that one of the axes lined up with, say, the direction of the string. Now, you, you might say, why would I ever do that? It's, it is sometimes convenient to tilt your axes. What we're really, because somewhere, if, if we look at this picture, if we look at this picture, some arrow somehow has to be broken up. If we align our axis this way, we have one arrow to be broken up. If we align our axis with the T, then we won't have to break up T, we'd have to break up the other three. You might say right there, well, that already, you might say right away, well, then there's my decision. Like, okay, I could see how you could tilt your axis to line up with T, but then I'd have to break up the other three. I'd rather only break up one than three. Wise thought, you have a point. That may be, that, that's maybe one of many reasons why in this case, I'm gonna keep my axes like this. I'm gonna keep my axes like this. I'm gonna to choose to line my X axis up with the table. And I'm gonna choose therefore to break up the tension into components. What I'm trying to stress to all, and that's what we're about to do, or we, what we sort of did Monday. What I wanna to emphasize to all of you is that on the inclined plane, if you think about it, it turns out to actually be more convenient to tilt our axes. And it doesn't even seem that way at first, but it does turn out to be. And that's what you're gonna show me on the final exam. You're gonna do a comparison of what happens. Yes, okay, so yes. So, all right, so I'll stop talking. But yeah, so I just, I really wanna alert everybody too that the issue here comes to choosing axes and then breaking up any vector that's not lined along an axis. So as John said, oh, or, or someone, oh, sorry, maybe it's, wait, is that direct chat? Oh, no, yeah, okay. So as John's saying in, uh, so I agree with what he's saying we're gonna do, hold up, we're gonna zoom in on, all right, so, so hold on. Except I don't agree with the 45 degrees just because it happens in this problem. I think I gave it that it was 30 degrees, but yes, the right, that's totally the right concept. Like, so we're gonna choose, we're gonna line up, we're gonna choose our axes. And I'm also telling you right now, good strategy when in doubt is if you wanna minimize the number of sines and cosines, and that's what we're really trying to do. We're gonna have some sines and cosines no matter what. Some things are gonna be broken up no matter what. But if we want a minimum number of sines and cosines, we're gonna strategically line up our x-axis with the expected direction of acceleration, which in this case is horizontal. Therefore, once I've chosen my axis, so I'm about to get to the thing that John's writing in the chat. Once I've chosen my axis, and for this case, I'm choosing, I'm choosing, hold on. And it is a choice. I chose these axes, right? And then if I do that, then I'm zooming in on the offender. If these are my axes, then all the vectors in my diagram are fine, except for T, which seems to be flying off at some angle. 
And what John's totally right about in the chat is, okay, what do I do to T? I break it up into its two components. I say that something pulling up and to the right is really pulling some amount up and some amount right. I mean, this is Sokotoa is what I'm doing. Um, now I'm, I'm doing this in general, like I'm leaving the numbers to the very end. So I totally agree with the concept that John's doing. It happens that once I plug in numbers, I think the angle that we're plugging in is 30 degrees just because I happen to have given that to you at the beginning of the problem, I think. But if this angle were 45, then right, I would, we would say T, you know, 50 sine 45 and 50 cosine 45. But anyway, so we zoom in on the tension or on the offending vector and we get its two components. And now what we're saying, the reason we got, like notice I just zoom in on that vector. All the other vectors are fine. I'm not gonna do anything with them. But the, my choice of axes forced me to simplify this diagonal vector. I have now decided that something that looked like a 50 Newton pull is really like, like a, what's gonna try to be a 44 Newton pull this way and at the same time, a 25 Newton pull this way. Don't I, the numbers I did in my head, but I'm saying cosine and sine are always fractions or decimals, right? Like cosine of an angle is never greater than one and sine of an angle is never greater than one. So cosine and sine are kind of just like fractions that are telling you to how the two jobs being done by tension are really apportioned between the horizontal amount of tension and a vertical amount of tension. So now I'm saying from here on in, instead of thinking of tension, I think of a vertical piece of tension or part of tension and a horizontal part of tension. So I rewrite my free body diagram. I've now taken T out and put in instead T sine theta and T cos theta, right? It's a replacement, please note that. I don't do a separate zoom in to figure out this T sine and this cosine, but now they go into my free body diagram. So now I finally have a component free body diagram that I can finally use to do the math. We started with a system schema that had four lines in it. That became a free body diagram that had four vector arrows in it. And wait, hold it. Right. That's right, John. And that's a key thing that I'm trying to say. Right. The tension that was going off on an angle now we sub we swapped out we're substituting in for it the the two component jobs that it's doing we're saying that when you pull up and to the right you're really pulling some amount right and some amount up and that's what goes in our diagram now and only those like john's last clarification in the chat is super important because honestly people make this mistake the op like the mistake he's warning against all the time we're not adding we're not additionally putting these two components in the diagram we're putting them in instead of the original hypotenuse because we don't we can't do any math with that hypotenuse because it's not lying along either of our two axes we want everything to lie along an axis so now we have a total of five and notice also that what i did to t was just what i did to t it doesn't affect any of the other jobs being done it's just saying that when you pull up and to the right, you're pulling some amount right and some amount up. So we put that in. So now this is our new diagram. Now we're, we're prepared. It says now we are prepared to plug force components of force components, sorry. To plug force components into net F, sum of F, the left side of, of, of that, sorry. The whole purpose of all this diagram work, which is the real work, is all to set up the math that's going to occur when we expand the left side of F net equals MA, and we put in a bunch of Fs in there. Wait, let me just see the chat. Oh, okay, yeah, so I think, right, so you don't even use 50, 10, 30, that's right. Okay, so, so now we can apply this to our first question. Our first question was, does this thing even accelerate along the horizontal axis? Have we even pulled it hard enough to get it going along the horizontal axis? So what we're really, we're, look, we're now starting to apply F net equals MA to the X axis. We're saying the sum of all the F, excuse me, the sum of all the X forces equals the acceleration along the X axis, right? So, and this is the key move now. So look at, 
I wrote, I just wrote athletic goals MA, but I wrote it for a particular axis. And then I expanded the left side and wrote T cosine theta minus, that's supposed to be a minus theory. T cosine theta minus F equals MAX. That's the key statement. Like almost from here on in, it's going to be like plugging and chugging and doing arithmetic, whatever. That's the statement that frankly, typical students or people wouldn't even know where that thing came from. If they hadn't walked through all of these diagrams that we just like, where did I get T cosine theta minus F equals uh, MAX? How did I know to count those two? How did I know not to count anything else? How did I know to put a minus sign before the F? It's totally from this diagram here. I just looked at the X axis and I was like, oh, everything pulling to the right, I called positive. So the only thing pulling to the right was T cosa. No problem. No, and you were more, I was warned. Oh, good to see you. Um, everything to the right, I gave a positive sign. So T cosine theta. And everything going to the left, I gave a, a minus sign, because which is F. So I'm just adding up all of the arrows that I see in this axis. This is the purpose of all of this diagram work is to be able to actually know what we mean by F net equals MA. It's always F net equals MA. The whole question is, what are we plugging in for F net? And the answer comes from these careful diagrams. So T cosine theta minus F equals MA. Now, if we're even trying, MAX, I should say. So we would start, we're going to start like plugging in numbers and like solving for A, except for one thing. We're here in that stage of, of static friction evaluation. We don't even know if there's an A yet at all. So what we're really looking at here is, is, is the maximum that static friction can handle. How does it compare to T cosine theta? Like, is there enough to even get us any acceleration, any non-zero acceleration? So uh, in other words, we're really looking first to see if A is zero or not. A will, um, A will be zero if, if uh, FS max is bigger than, A will not be a positive number if FS max is bigger than T cosine theta. Where an, an, F, an A will be a positive number if T cosine theta is greater than FS max. So we're really now, this is forcing us to compare the two and really seeing who wins here. Like, can the friction win and hold this thing in place or not? So we're really asking, is T cosine theta greater than FS max or not? What is FS max? Okay, do look down at the right, you know, in the blue. Can you go back to the professor? Sorry. Absolutely, sorry. Got it, thank you. Thank you, awesome, all right. So. Um, all right, so lower right hand corner. Technically, there's a little reminder. It kind of is like a bit, and this now starts to go to what John or somebody was, I think John was asking at the beginning of class. Um, also, again, you know, I posted videos and I think gave at least one live, like, like if you want an expanded, slower understanding of what's in the, or a more careful understanding of what's going on in the lower right hand blue, you know, please consult the videos. But quick summary, what we're saying is there's two types of friction. Friction, no matter which type, comes from squeeze and roughness. Squeeze is designated by the normal force. The normal force is how hard one surface is pushing against the other. And then the roughness, and that's measured in Newtons, that's a force. Take that force and multiply it by some fraction, some dimensionless coefficient, some number ranging from zero to one a number which represents the roughness of the material, and you'll get the overall friction force. The only catch is notice there's two different types of friction. So there's two different types of coefficient. I mean, there's two different coefficients, the kinetic coefficient for, for kinetic friction and the static coefficient for static friction. And the one subtle, and, and please know, and this again goes back to the question beginning of class, it's always one or the other. They never, like, all surfaces are identified by having both types of roughness. They have two numbers to, you know, to identify their roughness properties, but 
at any given moment, one type of friction or the other is acting, never both at the same time. And if you don't know which one is acting, you test static friction first to see. In other words, static friction is less than or equal to its maximum. Static friction will be whatever it needs to be up until a certain threshold. That threshold is mu sub s times the normal. Once we demand more than that threshold can handle, then static friction fails, the object starts sliding, and we are in the land of kinetic friction. Okay, so right now I'm comparing the horizontal pull to the horizontal maximum for static friction. That, that's what's happening in the black at the top of the page. The maximum that static friction can ever exert is always like, so this is like a formula, it's an equation, you know, that's written, you're reminded of in the blue down at the bottom, but I'm, sub, I'm substituting for maximum static friction mu s times the normal. So I'm being asked to compare here, t cosine theta, I'm, being, I'm asking myself whether it is or is not greater than mu s times the normal. Well, that raises the question, what's the normal? Now, this is very important. The normal, sorry, the normal gets people a lot. The normal force is not, there's no formula for it. There's not something that you just memorize, like the normal force is always five Newtons or the normal force is always equal to MG or something. No, no, the normal force isn't always anything. In fact, there are many problems where there's no normal force at all. Normal doesn't mean typical or regular or standard. Normal means, in math and science, normal means perpendicular. The normal force is, the for, in this case, is the force of the table pushing up against our block, the stronger that is, the harder that table is pushing, the more the two objects will squeeze to each other and the more friction we'll get. That's what this statement means. That friction comes from mu, the roughness, multiplied by the normal force. So we need to know what is the normal force here. How can we possibly know? We look at the other axis. This is why we've divided everything up into axes and why we're so precise about axes. If you look back at our picture, the normal force is acting on the other axis. And this is always how it is. The normal force is always perpendicular to the plane of contact. Friction is always parallel to the plane of contact. They are always the two perpendicular sort of components of the same overall phenomenon, which is surfaces rubbing against each other. So normal is always on one axis, friction is always on the other. If we've set things up the way we tend to do, normal will be on the y-axis and friction will be on the x-axis. So we've got to look at the y-axis to see what the normal force is. So I now, okay, so we started on the x-axis because that's what we think we care about. But the x-axis brought up the issue of friction. So friction is now forcing us to look at the other axis. So I go, at least temporarily, I go to the other axis and I apply Newton's second law. Some of the forces in the y-axis equals the mass times the acceleration in the y-axis. You see, and again, what I'm trying to drum in with everybody is each axis is its own little coordinate system. It's its own little reference frame. It's its own little world that physics happens in. The whole thing of physics is that the laws of physics are the same in all unaccelerated reference frames, unaccelerated coordinate systems, unaccelerated axes, whatever you want to say. The physics is a, the, each coordinate system of physics is its own little world where the laws are doing their own thing. So that's why we take pains to, to define our world and our perspective before we just jump in and start doing random math. All right, so I'm looking at the y-axis now, and I'm saying the sum of the y-forces must equal the mass times the acceleration in the y-axis. Well, what are the y-forces? I look at my component free body diagram. I'm going to flip back for a second. This is why I went through all these pains to draw it. I look at this picture right here. I look at the y-axis. What do I've got? I've got two forces um, going in one direction, the positive direction on the y-axis, and I've got one force going in the other direction of the y-axis. I've got three forces to add up in the y-axis. Only two of them are going in the positive direction and one's going in the negative. So it's going to be one plus the next minus the other. In, okay. In other words, looking at this picture, I'm saying n plus t sine theta minus mg all together equal ma on the y-axis. See what I'm saying? Um, 
And I'm just getting that from my diagram. Like it's obvious as long, or it's not obvious, but it's straightforward as long as my diagram is good and clear and clean. But this is why the diagram is so important. It's really doing the heavy lifting for the math. Like really, really. Also, please quick notice, everything I'm saying here would be true no matter what these numbers are. Like all of this is just how this works. If you have any theta at all, if you have any T at all, like I don't even need to know the numbers yet in order to be setting all this up. The numbers I'm gonna plug in at the last possible minute. So, all right, so this diagram tells me, oh, sorry, tells me that in the Y axis, see, I'm, I'm now expanding the left side of F net equals MA. All the action, all the details are always in the left side of F net equals MA. I'm saying N, plus T sine theta minus MG equals MA. Notice also, this is what I think we were saying this two days ago. You see, what I'm really trying to say is, you know, if you, okay, this is like one of those moments for all of us who are here in the class paying attention to stuff. Say you were to just take this final and never pay attention to class and then just try to turn your way through it on the web with help from the web or, book, you know, which you can do and all that. But it's really easy if you just go on the web or you just look at books, or even dare I say some tutors, not any tutors of anybody in this class, but if you just sort of blindly listen to other people, it's very easy to get to fall into the trap of thinking that N always equals MG. I, that, and that's wrong. But pe uh, often on this final exam, I'll see people write and they'll substitute in MG for N because that happens in some websites and some other scenarios and stuff like that. It's not the case. If you look here, what you see is that the table is only somewhat supporting the weight of the object. It's being helped a lot by the, by the string that's pulling up. That's what this is saying. N here, well, N here is what we're about to find out. I mean, great question, but we're about, we're doing all this to find out what N will be. It's, to be honest, it's not gonna be 50. We're going to find out what it is right now. What it is, I mean, it's a great question, but that's why we're doing this. Hold on, I just something just popped up on my screen. Professor, I have a question. I can't read something. Um, in the last question, the last equation, you have normal plus t cosine equals what? What is it that is saying that it equals? Oh, wait, uh, on on this page or on the other? Wait, no, which, on this page, n oh. plus t cosine equals, but I don't know. Oh, oh sorry. Oh, oh, sorry. So it says n plus t sine theta uh, equals mg. Sorry, hold on. I'll oh, okay. I was like, where did we get at low case? Oh, no, you're right. I'm sorry. Yeah, quite right. Um, so, oh, yeah. Okay. So, sorry. I almost did skip a step. You're totally right. Okay. So what I'm saying here is, um, yeah, we do have... Right, we, it's assumed that we know M, the mass, it was given, I mean, it happens to be three kilograms here, but it is known, we'll plug that in the end. And lowercase g always equals that 9.8 meters per second squared number, except that you can always, especially on the final exam, you can always round 9.8 meters per second squared to 10. G is the free, is the value, the constant value of a free fall acceleration due to gravity. So, Mass times acceleration gives us the force of gravity. Mg, m times g means the force of gravity, the weight of of um of the object. Now, but what I oh my god, sorry, there's something that's going on on my screen. Okay, what I'm saying here though is, at the risk of I, I, the line, I don't can you? I don't know if you can see. Well, the line on my screen that says N plus T sine theta minus MG equals MAY. I then stop and say, aha, wait a second. Frequently, we're using information about F's forces in order to compute A, acceleration. In fact, that's always ultimately our goal and ultimately on the X axis to use forces to get acceleration. But when we look at the Y axis, we have this cool, especially if we've set things up properly, when we look at the y-axis, we know the acceleration on the y-axis. We were never explicitly told, but we know the acceleration on the y-axis. If we've set things up correctly, if we've lined up the x-axis to be parallel to the expected direction of acceleration, then there is no acceleration on the y-axis. In other words, I'm just, in English, I'm trying to say that block 
is not flying up into space while we pull on it. Like, even if we're pulling it really hard, we're just trying to drag it along the ground. And it's not crashing through the ground. It's not falling through the ground. So whatever we're doing, whether this block is moving or not, it is not accelerating along the y-axis. In fact, we specifically aligned our axes so that we could be confident of that. We lined up our axis so that the y-axis is the axis along which no acceleration occurs. So we have information. We know that A sub y is zero. That's a huge amount. That's a really important piece of information. I'm substituting in zero for A sub y. That makes the entire right side of this thing become zero. Therefore, I can bring mg to the other side. And maybe I did this more steps than I needed to. But like, therefore, I'm saying the normal force and a vertical component of tension together are supporting the weight of this object. The table is not doing it alone. I'm doing, I'm helping support this object by pulling it up somewhat. N plus the vertical component of tension together are supporting the weight of the object. And therefore, if I'm looking to solve for the normal force, which is my objective here, if I'm looking to solve for the normal force, I'm just subtracting T sine theta from both sides and saying, aha, what the normal force is doing really here is it's supporting the weight of the object minus whatever effect was already done by T sine theta. The normal equals mg minus T sine theta. Please remember or please know that numbers were given for this problem. Once I get to the stage of plugging in numbers, every one of those things, M, I mean, this is like what John's saying and, and Starnish is saying in the chat, or they're both realizing, M is a number that we know. Lowercase g is a number that we know. T is a value that we know. Sine theta is a value that we know. Put all those numbers together, that will be the normal force. The normal force is not obvious. It's not memorized. It's not a formula. It is whatever it needs to be to make the y-axis work. In other words, and this is going to be true for your inclined plane on your final exam as well. The, what I'm really getting at is at the end of the day, the action will be along the x-axis. At the end of the day, acceleration will occur along the x-axis. If you set things up correctly, you'll always have to look at the y-axis at some point in order to figure out what the normal force is in order to then substitute that normal force in to the expression for friction on the x-axis. That, that was a mouthful, but that's what we're about to do right now. I'm just trying to say we're looking at the y-axis because we have to, in order to find out what the normal force is doing, we need the normal force for the x-axis. So, so it says at the bottom here, plug back into friction on the x-axis. That's what we're going to do. All right. So now we go back to the x-axis. Because okay, that's what we really care about. That's where the acceleration is happening. We were looking at the maximum force of static friction along the x-axis. The maximum force of static friction, like the maximum force is always mu s times the normal Another way to put the same, I'm sorry. Another way, sorry. Another way to say the same thing, because I'm just saying static friction itself is always less than or equal to mu s times the normal. Same, different way of putting the same idea. But so, all right, so, but that's what for, in other words, friction always comes from squeezing and roughness. What we just figured out on the y-axis was the squeezing amount. What is it? It's apparently mg minus t sine theta. So I substitute it in from the last page. Okay, now finally, I think I'm ready to put in numbers because we're being asked to do a comparison here. We're being asked to see how big is this maximum force of static friction? Well, apparently maximum force of static friction is 0.7. Like, so now I'm plugging in the numbers that were given at the beginning of the problem. Mu S was apparently 0.7. It was just given that that's a given. That's how rough the surfaces are. Then M is three kilograms. Lowercase g, oh yeah, as it says at the bottom of the page, is approximately 10 meters per second squared. So in other words, if your mass is three kilograms, then your weight is approximately 30 newtons. Newton is a unit of weight. Weight is the force of gravity pulling on you your mass is, is your resistance to forces in general. So, so three times time minus 50 is the tension. So the tension, like what John Ford was before sort of referring to as the, the tension piece, or excuse me, the tangent piece or the hypotenuse piece or whatever, the whole letter T is 50, but we're just looking here at the vertical component of T. So it's 50 times sine of 30, 50 times the fraction, one half. 
which gives me 25. In other words, in other words, if I'm the amount that I'm pulling up is is not 50 newtons, it's like 25 newtons. It's some portion of 50. And it would be a greater and greater portion if I were pulling up at a greater and greater angle. But okay, so I'm just plugging in numbers here. So Fs max equals 0. 0.7 times quantity 30 minus 25, uh, which is five. So 0. 0.7 times five is 3.5, right? Yeah, sorry, yeah. Um, so Fs max is 3.5 Newtons. Fs max is 3.5 Newtons. Put another way, at static friction will be anything it needs to be up to and including 3.5 Newtons. It can never, it just, the surface isn't rough enough and the surfaces aren't being squeezed together enough to ever exert more static friction than that. That's the most static friction can be, is 3.5 Newtons. But why do we get it? Because we were trying to compare it. We have to compare that to whatever force we're using to move, to attempt to move, to attempt to accelerate the object. We were trying to accelerate the object horizontally with T cosine theta. You see what I'm getting at here is when we were pulling at an, when we were pulling at an angle, we're really doing two jobs. We're pulling somewhat up and somewhat over. The over is directly contributing to our attempt to accelerate the object over, but the up, is indirectly contributing because the up is reducing ultimately the friction. Well, it's reducing the normal force, which reduces the friction being applied to this object. So anyway, we're now looking at this horizontal component of tension. T cosine theta equals 50 times cosine 30 degrees. That's 50 times 0.87. So around 44 Newtons. Again, I'm saying, it, like, you know, in, in arithmetic, maybe 20 plus 30 equals 40. But in a right triangle, 25 plus 44, sorry, sorry. In arithmetic, maybe 20 plus 30 equals 50. In a right triangle, 25 plus 44 equals 50. What do I mean? I mean, this leg of the triangle is like 25. This leg is like 44. Together, they make a hypotenuse of 50. I'm saying when you pull at an angle of 30 degrees with 50 newtons of force, you're really doing two jobs. You're pulling with 44 newtons of force this way, while at the same time, but independently, you pull up with 25 newtons of force. Okay, now we're saying we're pulling over with 44 newtons of force. That is definitely bigger than 3.5 newtons of force. So apparently our rightward pull most certainly and, 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 and you know blatantly exceeds the maximum force of static friction, the maximum possible force of static friction. So we win against friction. Friction cannot, uh, excuse me, static friction cannot succeed in doing what it's attempting to do. We break the static friction seal. All of this work, that we just did to look at the x-axis and the y-axis shows us that this object does accelerate. It will have an A that is greater than zero. That is our first like thing that we were trying to figure out. So we've got it. A great question. Great question. So now John Ford said, and, thank, and this one I'm like, John Ford now asks, okay, fine. So you found that A is greater than zero. Great. Can you actually find A? Yes. And that is actually our goal. That is the second question. That is what we have to do now. We have to actually find A. Luckily, we've done most of the hard work. It's not going to be that hard at all. No, I'm glad he asked. I'm glad you asked. In order to find A, the one thing we have to recognize now, since this thing is moving, since static friction failed, we just proved, and we couldn't know until we ran the numbers. We actually had to look and compare. It's not like I was holding out on you. Like We have to compare to find out. But now that we found out, that static friction maximum is insufficient and the thing is moving. Now we just do F net equals MA on the X axis, but with kinetic friction instead of static friction. We just assume now that the thing is gonna move and kinetic friction kicks into gear. So, so okay, so it says here, given that the mass does accelerate horizontally at what rate? What is A sub X question mark exclamation point? Totally John Ford's question. I and mean, that is our question. So now I say, and this is question two, like this is the question that we set out. I mean, it's not a side. I mean, John Ford's not bringing us off on a tangent. Like it, it is the point. Um, so no, now that the mass is sliding along the table, static friction is no longer applicable. Now kinetic friction acts, okay? So let me just see if I answer the chat. Oh yeah, okay, great. So great question, John Ford. So, so 
we go to the x-axis and we do f net equals ma along the x-axis. No, and we go, we look at our diagram, which is still sitting there, still the same diagram. And we say something that looks like deja vu. We say T cosine theta to the right minus F to the left equals MAX to the right. We've already said that like 20 minutes ago, only 20 minutes ago, the F that we were thinking about, we were testing to see what static friction was up to. Now we know that by F, we specifically absolutely mean kinetic friction. So I put a little K there. Okay, so it's the same. We're still doing the same procedure. And once you get used to this, it's always the same procedure. We're just adding up all the forces on a given axis and yield and computing the acceleration along that axis. So T cosine theta minus F sub K equals MAX is what I'm saying. So now, if you recall from the blue right-hand corner of a couple pages ago, what is FK? FK is always, in fact, yeah, FK is always, mu k times the normal. And once you, static friction is subtler and harder to deal with than kinetic friction because it's like a question always about static friction. But once you know it's kinetic friction, then kinetic friction always equals mu k times the normal. It's not less than or equal to, it's not a maximum, it just is. Mu, it'll just stay that same amount, mu k times the normal the whole time. And by the normal, we mean the very same normal that we already computed before. The normal force is not changing. The only thing that's changing now is the type of friction being generated by the normal force. So, so we have T cosine theta minus mu K times the normal equals MAX. So we turn to me. So T cosine theta minus mu K times the normal. So I just rewrote it at the top. Now we plug in just like we did before. <laughs> Excuse me. I really, even on Zoom, I guess I should cover my. Anyway, um. So, so I just substitute in an mg minus t sine theta for the normal force, just like before. Um, and again, notice. So now, notice that t sine theta is relevant, just as t cosine theta is relevant. They're both relevant to the x-axis because of friction. But okay. So we're almost done. We're solving for a sub x. We've got t cosine theta minus mu k. I mean, that mu k is supposed to be, it's not supposed to be like flying out there like that. That's not. So mu k is supposed to be multiplied by that whole quantity, mg minus t sine theta. Now, this all is starting to maybe look a little intimidating here, but first of all, we're just about done. Second of all, it looks intimidating because there's no numbers in there yet. And that's on purpose because just in case I make a mistake with the numbers or, or like the, this is all physics that's correct, no matter what the numbers are. And, and so I'm waiting to the last possible minute to put the numbers in. I'm solving for A sub X. I'm trying to answer again, like my original question, the standard physics question and John Ford's question, which is what the heck is the magnitude of acceleration. So I just divide both sides by M, right? I'm saying all that stuff, T cosine theta minus mu K times MG minus T sine theta, all equals M times A sub X. So I divide both sides by M because I'm looking for A. So A sub X equals all that stuff, T cosine theta minus, and, and, and sorry, and in one step, I also distributed the mu K, um, excuse me, I distributed the minus mu K. I, I, I distributed the minus sign as well. So I have, a sub X equals T cosine theta minus mu K MG plus mu K times T sine theta all over M. Looks very complicated. looks like a very complicated equation. And you might even say, oh my God, is that a formula that we have to memorize? We have to know? No, no, no. It's not a formula and you shouldn't memorize it. It's just a step in our work in this problem. When we do Newton's law problems, eventually the steps do look complicated, um, but they're just the steps in that individual procedure of solving Newton's second law. So now finally I'm ready to plug in the numbers and things will simplify now. 50 is T, right? I mean, T is the tension. That means that 50 Newton number from the start. Cosine 30 means cosine, um, cosine theta in this case is cosine of 30 degrees. And it says minus mu K. So now I put in mu K, the other coefficient, what's given in the problem, the other coefficient of roughness, always a number that's lower than the coefficient of static roughness. And they're always given, like, don't worry about that. But so it's 0.4.
mg is three times 10, like it's 30 newtons, okay, plus 0.4 again, times t 50 times sine of 30. So just plugging in the numbers. And when I work out all the numbers, it's approximate because, you know, I'm chopping off digits in the cosine and the sine, but I get 44 minus 12 plus 10. I get my final answer is that this block under these conditions is accelerating horizontally at approximately 42 meters per second squared. That's the answer. That's the problem. That's the end of that problem. And, and that's the answer to John Ford's question. Okay. That's a lot. The inclined plane that you're supposed to be looking at, that you supposedly did, you know, did look at it in lab five, and that you're like investigating somewhat deeply in the final exam, the inclined plane is just another Newton's law problem. It entails the exact same set of steps, the exact same procedure. Of just um, we're just going to apply to a different uh, to to a surface that's actually tilted, and that's what I'm going to show you when I'm looking at the chat. Sorry. Yeah. Wait, good question. No, no, no. Wait, good. Well, good question. I mean, the signs matter in this case, as in, in this case, positive means to the right and negative means to the left. Definitely like in the right of my picture and assuming that we can assume that right means east and left means west. Right. I don't know for a fact whether it meant north and south or east and west or what, but definitely positive meant to the right of my picture and negative meant to the left in my picture. I'm not sure if that's what you, but yeah, it's not, I don't know for a fact that that means east and west or north and south, but, um, but right, but, but direction does. Oh, wait, wait, oh, wait, wait. wait oh, this is actually a good question. I don't mean action, but this is a good question. Hold, hold on. And you're gonna see this in the final thing we do. My recommendation is always that we, remember we're all about choosing a coordinate system. And we want to choose a coordinate system that makes our life as simple and convenient as possible. So, okay, cool. So just to read, so this question that John's asking, if the string was being pulled from the left, would the sine and cosine values become negative? I would, they could, if we're consistent, we could consistent, but I don't want them to be. I want my life to be as easy as, right, right. So really the deal is if we're pulling up and to the right, we believe we're going to accelerate this thing to the right. And that's why I line up my positive X axis with the direction to the right. Like we intentionally, this is the whole idea of choosing to line up our coordinate system with the direction we expect things to accelerate in. So we can minimize the number of negative signs and we can minimize the number of signs and cosines. We want our work to be as simple as it can be. So that is a great question. And we're really going to see that now if we apply this like to the inclined plane of the final exam and of lab five. Like, how does this all apply to an inclined plane? Well, so an inclined plane is very, very similar. I mean, it's got a mass, it's got roughness and friction, and it's got a tilt, only the tilt is built in. We don't even have to, in an inclined plane, the angle is already the angle of the plane. And we don't even have to pull this thing with a string or anything because it's automatically going to slide down to to some component of gravity on the inclined plane. So here's our setup now is that we've got an M, we've got it on some plane angle that theta. I, you could assume the exact same numbers if you want as before. I'm not even concerned about the numbers. Just like before, I'm gonna to try to solve this physics based on these letters. And then at the last minute, plug in numbers if I have them and if I have to. But the question of the inclined plane is gonna be the same question as before. If we can first show that the mass actually is accelerated, if we assume that there's enough gravitational pull to exceed the static friction and get this thing to accelerate at all, then our ultimate question is gonna be again, what is the acceleration? Can we get an expression like we did uh, two pages ago for A equals blah, 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 blah. Can we take all of our given uh, and fundamental constants and put them together in a way that produces an acceleration value for us. Yes, we can, that's what we're here to do. And we're gonna do it the exact same way that we did that problem. For, and I'm gonna do go a little faster. We've got 11 minutes, we also have Monday, of course. But, and, and yeah, so I'm gonna say, how do we do this? How do we dive in and break things down so that we can ultimately get an acceleration? First, always we draw system schema. And 
we've talked about this a lot, so I'm going to say it fast now, the system schema, we put in planet Earth or celestial Earth or center of Earth or entire Earth first, always, it's there, it's got one line connected to the mass, gravitational pull, then we put in anything and everything touching the mass. The only thing touching the mass now is what we're calling the plane or the surface or the slide or whatever we call it. That thing, like just like the table in the other example, is a surface pushing against our object. Surfaces pushing against each other automatically always push in two ways, one against, but then they also rub and slide. So I draw two lines in the system schema. Now there's no tension or there's no string. There's nothing else touching the object in this case, in this regard. This is actually an easier problem than all of the stuff we had to deal with a moment ago. This act, if we can really understand that, in many ways, this is, yeah, yes. Oh, no, sorry. A great question, Stranish. The acceleration was 42, but 42 meters per second squared is the units of acceleration. It was 42 meters per second squared, if that's okay. And, uh, and if you want me to turn back the page, let me know and I will, but if not, I'm gonna just keep going. But great question and units definitely do met. Got it, okay, great, great, thank you. And that's totally points, points, points. Okay, so notice here, this system scheme is actually simpler than the other one because there's no tension in this case. There's no string, there's nothing else touching the mass. So now I'm gonna go on and draw my pure free body diagram there will only be three vector arrows in my pure free body diagram. One is gravity pulling straight down as it always does, as it did in the other case, as it will here. But now this object is slot. So, but now this object is on a slant. It's on a surface that's pushing not just straight up. The other surface in the other problem was horizontal. So it pushed straight up. This surface is tilted. So it's pushing at a tilt. The, the surface, remember, like notice how my diagram was in this case. The inclined plane is going like from top right to bottom left. So the plane is pushing from underneath the block, pushing against the block, just like the floor was or the table was in the other case. So the table is pushing up and to the left, right? You see the normal force is up and to the left. Totally not balancing gravity. It's just up and to the left from the surface. And the friction is along the surface always. Friction and normal are always perpendicular to each other, the friction is pushing up and to the right. Why? Because the object is trying to slide down, right? So again, whether this would be static friction or kinetic, if the block is trying to slide down, the friction is resisting that and pointing up and to the right. Let me just look in the chat for a second, sorry. Oh, got it, okay, cool, cool, cool. So this is our pure free body diagram. This is actually easier in a way, or at least smaller number of forces than the other free body diagram. This is pure now, and, and this, these two steps would be the same in the final exam, which even though you're being asked to do the free, uh, you're being asked to study the inclined plane like two different ways, they're going to be the same way to this point. The way the two different ways branch now is when we look at this pure free body diagram, we say, okay, now I got to start dealing with X and Y axis. I looking at that picture and those arrows are not all parallel or perpendicular to each other. Some of some of them are flying off axes. I need all arrows to lie along an X or a Y axis. So now I got to choose what is my X or Y axis. I got a choice. Am I going to make this my X and Y axis like I did before? Or am I going to tilt it? Well, you might think, well, come on, we're used to this. Like, come on, like this is a standard way. This is an X axis, this is a Y axis. Let's do what we did before and let's not complicate our lives or anything, come on. And let's, let's leave the Y axis to be parallel with gravity so we don't have to break up gravity or anything weird like that. Very fair instinct. And in fact, in part of the final exam, I ask you to see what happens if you in fact do that. In one half of the final exam, you're asked to choose this coordinate system and solve the problem and see what happens. And the truth is, if you do it correctly, you will get a correct answer. But I'm also telling you right now, the purpose of the final exam is that you'll do all the work to choose this axis and work accordingly. But what you're gonna find is, if you do it right, that you do get the right answer, but you have to do a lot of work and you have a lot of sines and cosines to deal with if you do this, because, Two reasons. One, if you do this, if you and I, I'm watching the clock, but believe me, but if you do this and you keep the same axes as we did in the other problem, the same axes that seem natural, like horizontal, vertical, they might seem natural. But here's the problem. Number one, look at this diagram. Now, two forces are not lying along those axes. One is, yes, gravity. But two, 
the friction and the normal here are not. So now we wouldn't just have to break up one force like we did in the other, we'd have to break up two forces. Okay, that's disadvantage number one. But here's an even bigger point is that this object on the inclined plane, it's not gonna be sliding this way or this way. It's, it's, it's gonna be accelerating along a slant. Its acceleration is gonna be along a slant. So if we use these two axes, it can be done and it will be done and you'll do it on the final exam, you'll show, but it's a lot of work because you got two forces that have been broken up with sines and cosines and acceleration will have to be broken up with sines and cosines. So what we do, what you did in the lab that might've seemed weird or unnatural or unmotivated at first is what the other choice to make equivalently correct, but more convenient and more wise, more strategic. The choice we're gonna make is the same type of choice we made before. We're gonna line up our x-axis to, to line up with our expected direction of, ex of acceleration. In other words, we're gonna tilt our axes, that in our heads. That's really what was happening in the lab. We're gonna call it, we're gonna say the x-axis is parallel to the plane, and therefore the y-axis is perpendicular to the plane, and therefore F and N are really fine, and it's gravity that's gonna be the offender now. And again, when you first see this in lab, it is confusing. It's so confusing that some of you might not even know why you were confused, and you might've just like had a brain explosion, and you might've just accepted it and moved on and not never know why. But, in the, but what we're saying here, and we'll keep talking about this on Monday, but in the four minutes I have left, I'm saying that if we line up our axes so that X is like that and Y is like that, then MG is the offender of something that looks straight down, that looks like just a nice little leg of a Pythagorean trail is actually a diagonal line in that coordinate system. It actually has to be broken up. It actually has to be treated as the hypotenuse of, of, a, of, a, of a right triangle. So if I zoom in on gravity, the offender, right? Yes, I think that's right. I'm going to agree with that. I'm just, I'm going to blast on try just because we're only three minutes, but I think I agree with that. Yes. Just forgive me for, and I'll just forgive me. Sorry. But yeah, MG is straight down. It is doing two jobs by gravity pulling on the block. It's pulling some, okay, wait, but let me, sorry, let me just try to, because we only have three minutes. Uh, but yes, that's what I'm saying that. Yes, that's what I'm saying. Good. Um, so I'm saying, but treat MG now as the hypotenuse of its own little vector triangle. Then one leg is MG times sine of theta and the other leg is MG times cosine of theta. Whichever leg is opposite to the angle gets sine, whichever is adjacent gets cosine. So what we're really saying here is just like tension, when you pull up and to the right, you're really doing two jobs. One, you're pulling up and at the same time, you're pulling a little bit over. If gravity is pulling down, it's really doing two jobs. It's to some extent, pulling the object into the plane, opposing the normal force from the plane. That job is the portion of gravity called mg cosine theta. Gravity is also, to a certain extent, a portion of it is pushing the object along the plane. A fraction of the object's weight is contributing to sliding it along the plane. That's mg sine theta. So where we're gonna leave things for today, that's the zoom in on gravity. We take those legs and substitute them back into, and this is the last page, back into the free body diagram. So now we have our final component free body diagram. Instead of having just, the, so the system schema had three forces, three lines. The pure free body diagram has three vectors, but one of them was MG. It was an offender. We broke it up into two vector components. So now we have a component diagram. And now what we can do, and this, we're done, but now, I mean, we're going to finish this on Monday, or you can think it through or look in the exam, you'll see what's happening. But with this axis, we'll say F net equals MA along the X axis. This is the, all right, this is the X axis. And we'll say that F net also equals MA along the Y axis, just like we did before. We'll say normal minus MG cosine theta equals MA sub Y. And we'll say that MG sine theta minus friction equals MA sub X. That's what we're gonna do, just like the other problem. And if we had chosen different axes, which is the other option, and you'll see that Monday, um, it's all the same procedure. You just you choose the axes so that you can break up vectors 
put their pieces on the axes, and then just look at one axis at a time and just have add up all the forces on that axis to get the total acceleration on that axis. We're going to continue this for our very last class Monday and just finish it to you. But please do, and please also note again, solutions are in that practice final exam. So, you, you know, it would be great for you to see if you can understand the rest on your own. In a way, I've given you all the, the trees now, you just grow the fruit or whatever. I've given you the metaphor, just mix it. Um, but the importance of choosing your axes is that's what tells you how to break up the vector components. Once you break up the vector components, then you can do F net equals MA along each axis independently yet simultaneously. Now, and I'm going to say also, I think the questions have been great. I hope I've answered them. Of course, you could still text me and email me and stuff like that. And please do bring the questions to next class. But I'm going to hop off now because I have to go do a final class for the other class for yes thank you guys so much but please forgive me that i'm going to hop off more quickly than usual because i have physics 102 waiting in the wings but thank you so much you guys are doing great thank you um, thank you <laughs>